I thought we would begin with the very intriguing title of this exhibition, uh, which Gabe just mentioned, Imminent Perils to Wonder at Trifles in the Paintings of John Bierman. And um, that comes from a favorite Nabokov quote of yours. And I thought I would read a very shortened version of that quote to frame our conversation. Um, in a sense, we are all crashing to our death from the top story of our birth to the flat stones of the churchyard and wondering at the patterns of the passing wall. This capacity to wonder at trifles, no matter the imminent peril, these asides of the spirit, these footnotes in the volume of life are the highest form of consciousness. There's a lot in that in there, yeah. and um, it really does frame your work in such a meaningful way. I thought I'd ask you to um, tell me, tell us a little bit more about the sentiment behind that quote and why it has always been so meaningful to you. Sure. Well, can you guys hear me? I yes. have a wire on me. I feel like I'm in the old movies where the guy wore a wire and he <laughs> gets caught by the mafia. And stuff like <laughs> but anyway, I'm glad you can hear me. Um, so this quote, this this quote uh, spoke to me. I cut it out. I read it in the paper years ago, and it's this kind of a brown piece of newsprint hanging up in my studio. It's, it's been with me forever, and I I just love. I I I've been very fortunate. I the the wonder of this world. I feel like we're here for such a short time, and there's such awfulness awfulness in this world and I I feel very fortunate that I'm able to spend time in the beautiful part of this world and, and explore that and try to represent that and share that with people and um, to me that quote kind of spoke to that, that there is wonder in this world and uh, that's that that's true thank you um, so as you, as you say, you want to record the wonder of this world. Yeah. You also make a point of saying, um, when asked, that your art is not, you don't consider it sort of high concept. You say right. it's primarily visual. Could you talk a little bit more about that distinction and what you mean by that? Um, I, I don't think I'm a head first artist. I mean, I'm a, I, I, I respond to the landscape and I, I feel very, um, uh, important for me to actually be in the landscape to experience it fully and that's I just came back from teaching a two-day workshop and some of my students are here um, over in Linville and I try to stress that um, we're not just taking a snapshot and moving on and going back to the studio and working from a piece of paper or a picture but the, but to be in the air and the wind and the light and to try to connect with that uh, is a really important thing in my work. And even though I end up working on these pieces and making studio paintings from them, the, it all starts in the landscape. And um, so that's a, a piece of my process. And, and you have a lot of discipline in your process. Um, you and I have talked at some length about just how much uh, sort of um, rigor you bring to your painting process. You, tend to go to the same places at the same time every day. You make your own gesso, your own egg tempera. You, um, you're very industrious in your creativity. Um, what does that look like on a given day? Uh, well, um, I, love, I love craft, actually. And when I went to art school, uh, craft was really not appreciated. You know, craft was not, it just wasn't appreciated. And my favorite teacher, <coughs> Um, sent me to, over to the illustration department to learn about egg tempera. And that's a very, uh, uh, it's, you, you have to learn how to do it. It's not, you just put paint down. And it's a process, and it's a wonderful process. And I, and I, love, uh, I love materials. And it's a, uh, egg tempera, for instance, it's just uh, egg yolk and pigment. And that's it. And it's a, it's a from the Renaissance, it's, it was it was one of the the best mediums ever. It actually outlasts oil paint, uh, egg tempera. Um, so I, I love. I mean, it's like not, I'm not much of a cook, but I imagine it's cooks who love who love to make things. I'm a maker, so I, I instead of not instead of, but in in concert with whatever ideas I have, I, I, it's all grounded in in the making, the process, and often. Through the process, 
I get, I get ideas that weren't generated from up here. <laughs> so I like that kind of uh, integration of, of work. It's interesting that you say that the process can make creative ideas spark in your mind because I think a lot of people might think that a very disciplined process would be in some way at odds or fighting with a, a creative and, and sort of spontaneous um, effort. Well, it's funny because I can't um, help but change my process all the time. I change mediums and I, I just can't seem to ever paint the same way twice. <laughs> and sometimes it's, it's uh, I can't quite figure that out, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing in the long run. Because I, I like to stay open. I feel like once I say, well, this is the way it's got to be done, I close myself off to other possibilities. And, uh, you know, we want to stay fresh and, and grow. And uh, um, so I, uh, I, try to, uh, I try to follow that lead. And sometimes it takes me into places or, or, or you know, images or processes that I hadn't originally planned on, but it, it will ultimately make the work that I'm, that I'm feeling I need to make. Mm -hmm. And that does change. I mean, you're, you're well known for the beautiful landscapes that you capture um, and for capturing the wonder of the natural world, as you said earlier. But you also, your work takes you to some not so obviously beautiful places mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, and you told me recently that you've been spending a whole lot of time in a food lion parking lot. Yes. Um, <laughs> what, what do you see there? That's a, a, a part of North Carolina, right? <laughs> And I, and I, you know, I was looking at um, uh, Canaletto paintings, you know, Venice, uh, 19th, 18th century, and, uh, you know, you see all, uh, the number of them, you see the backwash too, uh, the fishermen and all that, and then all the stuff going on, and the beautiful boats, and I was thinking, well, what, what is, what do we show today for that, uh, what can I show? Well, it's, Food line parking lot a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it would be bizarre if I'm painting gondolas and stuff like that, but that's, that was the transportation mean of that, of that era. You know, well, let's, so let's really look at what we use, trucks and all that kind of stuff. And plus, I, I've, I've discovered I love trucks. Uh, these <laughs> And the colors, you know, that's as a landscape painter who, who has dwelt much with, you know, natural landscape color, greens and blues, as we saw yesterday as we were painting, uh, it's, it's great to introduce a man-made color uh, and uh, that, that you'll find at the parking lot. <laughs> no question about it. And yeah. I think there's also... Um, as I, under, as I picture this painting that you've been sketching, this painting in the works that you've been sketching in the food line parking lot at 10 o'clock every morning, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, that there's, a, there's an expanse of wall beside yep. of the, of the, of the grocery store that the light is reflecting upon. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I gather that that's as much about what the painting's about as the colorful yeah. trucks. Yeah. So do man-made man, do man objects, when you decide to include them in your work, Oh, this one has some telephone poles. Right. Do they provide you with more than just a surface to reflect light or a new color palette? Do they help you tell a different story? I don't think so. I never like to have, um, again, it's like head first. I, I don't really like to say, well, I want to I want to make a statement. I, I've never been, that's just never seemed right to me. Mm -hmm. um, and there are plenty of artists that do it and do that well, but um, I don't think I'm that smart. <laughs> I, I, tr no, I trust my eye, and, and I go where the eye goes, and yeah. then, then it works. When you, when you sketch in plein air, which mm -hmm. you do regularly, um, and you're doing in, in the parking lot right now, and you do in beautiful places as well, um, you are doing more than just drawing that place. You are figuring out the spatial dynamics. You are plotting an eventual painting. What else are you doing with these repetitive daily sketches? Why isn't one enough? Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I know. I wish, I wish one was enough. I, <laughs> the most fun I have as an artist, and again, I mentioned this to my group those last two days, is there's nothing more fun than being outdoors and painting on a beautiful day like you have up here uh, all the time. 
well, not all the time. We have rain, and we, we had a little bit of that. Um, <laughs> but that, that is truly my, my, the joy. Uh, the studio is more work. And how, how am I going to put all this information that I've gathered? That's what I'm doing with these plein air sketches. I'm gathering information, and then I'm reassembling it in the studio. Uh, so I don't know if I've answered Yeah, no, you, yes. Yeah. And you also have talked about how, you know, painting, painters throughout time have used this as their, um, their means of, of understanding and communicating with the landscape or a portrait subject or anyone else, small sketches over time that can then help an artist create a dialogue with that subject. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like when you, when you go to a certain place day after day at a certain time of day that you are learning it in a deeper way that you need to? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's rare you capture uh, something at the first pass. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I, I keep, because it's so fresh in my mind, uh, my students, uh, every, it's, it takes like three passes, and that can be three days of, and because we're outdoors, the sun moves, you have about an hour and a half to do that. And then you put that aside, and the next day you come back at the same time, that same hour and a half, and you look at it again, and you start to see better what you were not noticing the day before, yeah. and so on and so on. So it takes some time. It takes some time. You mention um, artists that came before all the time yeah. when, you, when you talk about your art. Um, I, I wrote down just a few names that have come up in conversations that you and I have had. Um, Corot, Giotto, Sonino Sonini, uh, William de Kooning, Piero della Francesca, uh, Whistler. I mean, they go, the list goes on mm -hmm. and on. It's a, it's a really interesting mishmash and combination of eras and styles and types of art. What do you learn when you study these um, artists that came before? Are you, looking at, are you looking at their technique? Are you trying to get inspired? Um, is it a way to broaden your way of seeing the world? Oh, all of those, about all of those. Um, I love, I love art, and I love looking at art, and these, it's that cliche, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of those who came before us. And I, and I felt, I, I have felt, um, you know, there's a little schism with modernism, because I felt that it's kind of left a uh, huge, rich treasure of art history. Uh, and I feel I try to kind of build a bridge back to that and, and uh, learn from that uh, what, what's come before us and, and kind of integrate it into a modernist sensibility. And that's, that's kind of my, my, the zone I like to operate in. So I'm always looking at, uh, and discovering artists uh, of past and present, you know. And, uh, very, it means a lot to me. Well, you had a really interesting education in art as well. Um, you went to a, a, what sounds like a really unusual and remarkable boarding school. Oh, yes. Um, which got your creativity. Yes, um, it, it was. Um, first co ed board, boarding school in America, 1945. Uh, my friend Catherine Stern went there as well. Um, I found it. I, I went to Page High School for six weeks. Uh, that's the high school, one of the high schools in Greensboro, North Carolina. 2,000 students, uh, the art class, so I took, signed up for the art class, and in the class, the assignment was to make a collage for GM, and there was a stack of magazines over in the corner, and I went over there with my scissors, I, I pulled up a magazine, New York Times magazine, I'd never heard of that, um, so I'm going through it, and then back in the old days, they had these little ads in the back for schools and camps and stuff like that. And I read this ad that said, um, uh, three, uh, high school on a 300-acre farm, uh, stressing the arts and humanities. And I, was, I probably didn't even know what humanities were. Um, <laughs> but I liked the idea of uh, art and the farm. And I heard Vermont was a beautiful place. And six weeks later, because it's four terms that started in October, I was up there uh, for three years. And it was a very small school, 60 students, uh, 20 faculty, a very special place. And I just saw the, um, uh, the, the, the little brochure from way back then, this would be the mid-70s, and the tuition was $895. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's like, oh my god. And any, you know, even that was like a thing, right? But um, I, I feel I, that, and the kids came from all over. 
uh, uh, the, the, you know, and uh, so it was a great, and there were programs that brought uh, kids from Harlem up there. So it was a real mix, a diverse crowd if there ever was one. And uh, it was just great. So that, that was wonderful. And then you went to the Rhode Island School of Design. And I went there after that and, and really started focusing on my art more and more, which I had, it always, the art was always, I, you know, I was the guy in the grade school class who did the bulletin boards. You know, <laughs> so it was always a big part of my life. I, I know you had a, a teacher there who was really instrumental. You told me at one point you think about him every day. That's true. Jer Jerry Eminem, is mm -hmm. that his, his yeah. name correctly? Mm -hmm. um, he opened up the world for me, you told mm -hmm. me. Uh, he was the real thing. He encouraged you to focus on landscapes which was then unfashionable. Um, yeah. Most of the art of the 20th century was sort of more about cities and urbanism. And, yeah. and here you were, this young man, wanting to paint the natural world, like people who had come long before you. Mm -hmm. What was it that made you decide at that? You, you were obviously drawn to doing something very different when you took yourself to the boarding school. You, were, you, were, uh, you had an avant-garde sensibility. What mm -hmm. made you decide that you wanted to paint landscapes at such a young age? Oh, um. And by the way, this, this mentor fellow, Gerald Emmon, and, uh, who, who was a, my, one of my teachers freshman year at, at Rhode Island School of Design, um, he was a completely abstract painter. So he, he wasn't like, landscape is the way to go. He, he, was, he was supporting me in what I wanted to do. And that just meant the world to me. Because I was you know, a kid from North Carolina going up to, to the school in Providence and surrounded by like the best and brightest of all these talented kids and um, he was saying stick to your guns and that meant that meant the world to me and I, I still have to remind myself sometimes you know, stick to your guns <laughs> and um, so but why were those your guns why? why why was landscape what you had focused on oh yeah that's a good question yeah, all right. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, 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 I have an idea, and um, my, my partner Toy has heard this so many times, she's going to go, no, not again. Uh, my grandparents had a cottage on Lake Toxway. Yeah. They were from Columbia, and they went up to Lake Toxway, and this was back in the 60s. There weren't a whole lot of homes at that time on Lake Toxway, and um, I had a second uncle or something like that, third, um, uh, Uncle Virgil, and I was two, three, four, five years old, six years old, and Uncle Virgil would bring his paint kit, he was a Sunday painter, and I used to see him out there on the, on the porch painting, and I think that had a lot to do with it, and also um, there was no or little TV back then, so a kid, and there was obviously you no know, pad screen time, so it was something to do for the summers. Uh, we would go up and hang out for you know, two or three months up there. And, uh, uh, I think that, that uh, was conducive to uh, finding something to do yourself and create something. You know? Sure. So <clears throat> your landscapes, I assume then and certainly now, they're not just purely representational, to say the least. Um, in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, there's a lot of modernism in them, a lot of shape and color, and, um, and, and really very studied composition. Um, and I know that when you were a student, you also did some studies, color and shape studies, not unlike Joseph Albers, you know, rectangles and colors over and over again. What did you learn from that? Um, what, I, I, what I like, I think the part of the craft of, it's like I always think that Bach couldn't really play the piano unless he practiced his scales and got all of that stuff down. And that also is against some of this modernist thought that it's just express yourself. But I can't really express yourself if you, have, if you don't know language or don't have a language. And so these little squares that I used to do, the uh, one color, what happens if you just mix it with this other color, they were really practicing scales. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it, I think it. I, I think it helps. I'm not sure, honestly, mm -hmm. because often when I'm painting, I'm not thinking about that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, if I if I get stuck in a painting, I might be able to retrieve some of that knowledge, and and uh, that might be able to resolve it through through some of that. Well, it gets back to this idea of discipline that you bring to your work today, and that you mm -hmm. always have. You told me at one point that you were one of the hardest working kids at RISD, 
And you said the kids who got there and everything came easily to them, they didn't stick with it. Mm. Do you think that that's still true about you? Well, I, I wouldn't say I was a, the hardest working kid, but, but <laughs> no, no, I think what I was trying to express in that statement was that the kids that everything came easy to, they, they didn't end up having a career in art. I, mean, I don't know, it's just, it, maybe it wasn't a much, enough of a challenge to them. For me, the challenge was great and, and it, it meant a lot of hard work and that kept me involved with it. Uh, um, is that still important, that sort of industriousness and fortitude? Well, I, 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 um, just to, sh to show up is 90% of the battle and I, I keep like, hours in my studio, mm -hmm. for sure, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, because if I, if I just, with my feelings, you know, uh, if I went by my feelings, I'd rather stay home, stay in the house, have another cup of coffee and read the paper some more, but you know, at <laughs> a certain time, it's, nope, gotta go, <coughs> gotta get to work. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of your early work um, when you were living in the Hudson River Valley, which you did for almost few decades. Um, and you painted um, in a manner that wasn't dissimilar from some of the Hudson Valley painters. There was a group, an offshoot school of the Hudson Valley painters, the Illuminists, mm -hmm. who I know really inspired you. Um, and their, their focus was on light and sort of tranquility, and I know some of that is you really um, kind of adopted as your own. Um, you also then had a lot of success as a printmaker. Mm -hmm. And you were living in Nyack, right on the Hudson. Mm -hmm. um, you were um, working for Jasper Johns, mm -hmm. um, again, a whole other kind of art. Mm -hmm. And you were learning, you were learning a, a different kind of work than what you're known for now. It was very successful right away. You had a big successful show in New York, a whole lot of attention. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about that. Oh, it's wonderful. It was wonderful. Um, my first show in Manhattan uh, sold out. And I don't know if that ever happened to me again. <laughs> so that, it was, a, it was a, a blessing or a curse, I don't know, because you think, oh, it's, well, at, I don't know, I was 30 maybe. It's like, oh, this is just going to be great, great, great. I, w I went and I bought a Miata and uh, <laughs> all of that. And, uh, but, but, you know, and, and then I think there was like a crash, a market crash or something, and the next show is, uh-oh, uh, you know, i got to keep paying for all this stuff. Uh, so, um, so it was heady to start a career with sales in Manhattan and attention and, and you know, all of that. It was very heady. Uh, but but you, that's not sustainable, and, and, and I think it's a false thing to try to sustain, and um, I, I think I... I don't think I've ever been happier than I am now painting in Hillsborough with my group of friends and all of that and um, uh, yeah. Um. Well, and then you just come back home, right? And I, and I came back home. Yeah. yeah. So born and raised in Greensboro, um, and the South really never left you. You come after all those decades um, up in the Hudson River Valley and in the Northeast. What do you think it means to be a North Carolina artist? What does that mean to you? I don't know. I don't know, but I know it's one of the most beautiful states around, and I think that is also uh, um, just really helped me as a painter or, or inspired me. Um, it wasn't that when I was growing up? Wasn't North Carolina known as the variety vacation land? Mm -hmm. Does anybody recall that? Yes. And I remember that, and I remember like hearing it on the radio. I thought there was a song, <laughs> but did I dream that? Was there a little <laughs> song, <laughs> a jingle? And it's so true. It's so true. I mean, in Hillsborough, a couple of hours we're up here in this most gorgeous mountainous area, and a couple of hours the other way you're at the beach. So I think I grew up with the landscape uh, being such a part of my my. Uh, Growing up, so it's great. The muse is here. <laughs> Pardon? The muse is here. Yes, the muse. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a quote from Proust a couple of times that it's not about looking at new landscapes, but looking at old landscapes with new eyes. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. what is your what do your eyes see these days? What is your gaze looking like? What does it focus on? Oh, um, I don't know, but I mean, I, I I'll answer it in a more general way. I. I just try to, sometimes I paint things that are kind of been painted a lot and have turned to cliches in a way. 
um, like the lighthouse. There's a painting downstairs of a lighthouse, and some people don't even realize it's a lighthouse, and that's okay. But I like to, I like to um, bring uh, life to these things that have gotten kind of tired and uh, happening and commercialized or. Um, I think there's still something there, and I, part of my challenge is to give new life to these kind of old, stale representations of a lighthouse or the landscape. Uh, I still think there's uh, good stuff in there to, to work with. I'd like to ask you about um, one of the most mesmerizing and interesting parts of your work, which is the mystery that you somehow embody in these, mm -hmm. in these landscapes and other paintings that you do. You once um, told me that there's a, the photographer Dorothea Lang uh, said something that you think about a lot. She said, I go into the studio, I get lost, and every so often I get found again. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering, is that where the mystery comes in? Oh, absolutely. I, I, often I, I'm just at a loss of what I'm doing, but I stick with that and then things start coming to me. And um, I know if I show up in the studio, uh, and I can tolerate that feeling of, of um, not knowing where to go. Eventually, if I can be patient enough and not get down on myself enough, eventually something fresh comes up that um, I, I might have run right over if I was in a rush to get to some answer. So, yeah, things come slowly to me. <laughs> Well, it's, I'm wondering, is it, is it too simple to, to wonder this, that when you're doing these studies, like the Food Line parking lot at mm -hmm. 10 o'clock in the morning recently, 10 o'clock in the morning every, you know, every day, um, that you're trying to get the, the essence of the place, and when you go into the studio, you're trying to find the essence of you and how that combines. That's beautifully said. Yeah, I think that's, I have been thought of it like that, but that's it. You told me that you read Emil Zola and it changed your work tremendously because you understood from those writings that your own personal um, perception and your own personal understanding was valuable, and, I don't, and you didn't know that before. Mm. Is that yeah. too That's simply stated? No, I mean, it's the general idea, for sure. Yeah. So the awe and mystery of your work. Um, I, you told me once you didn't set out to do it, but you opened yourself up to it, um, that it's organic. I found something really neat, and I actually didn't find it. It was given to me by a really thoughtful friend, Billy Wilson, at the Art Museum, which is this um, program uh, from a 1991 exhibit at the North Carolina Museum of Art. And he asked me, my friend Billy asked me, oh, I see, you know, you're talking to John. Do you have this catalog? But I have this catalog from 1991. Of course I don't. I'd love to see it. Um, and so he brought it to me, and um, it's, it's wonderful. Um, John Coffey, wonderful curator um, has a terrific introduction and I wanted to read something that John wrote oh. in this. Um, this is we didn't talk about doing this so I'm putting you on the spot. John, John Coffey wrote this? John Coffey wrote I mean, this. Not John Bierman, that part. John no. Coffey wrote this about John Bierman. <laughs> okay. okay, I want to be sure you get this part. <laughs> um, John Coffey in his introduction said that um, he was talking about how at the time of this exhibit, which again you're living in at Nyack in, in the York, Hudson yeah. River Valley, and this is a North Carolina Museum of Art exhibit of our North Carolina native, native who had unfortunately left for New York. Little did we know he'd come back. Um, so he says, um, at the time he mentions that you were living um, in the rambling Victorian house that was the home, the childhood home of Joseph Cornell. True. Yeah. So the Joseph Cornell, I'm sure many of you know, makes these wonderful, make these wonderful um, shadow boxes and um, miss, I think he called some of them mystery boxes, filled with found objects and and little sketches and things. Um, so this is where John said, the coincidences are surely charmed. Uh, I'm sorry, wait, I missed part of it. No, I didn't. The coincidences are surely charmed, for the twilight topography of Bierman's landscapes recalls both the romantic ideal of the Hudson River School painters and Cornell's timeless, enigmatic dream world. Oh, and the I timeless, know. enigmatic yeah. dream world, that's what I, I'm, it's, it's such a compelling part of your work and so hard to describe. And I just wonder what, what, it, what it means to you. Do you see it when you look at your work? No, I don't think so. Um, I know, but, but I, that, hmm, I, don't know, I don't know how to respond. I mean, yeah. it's just so well said. I don't know what to add to that. Um, but I, I, I love that, 
I don't know, always, I don't think I really know what my work is about, <laughs> honestly. I don't, because as I said, I don't really, I don't feel like I'm making a statement. I don't have a conscious idea. I want to, you know, I want people to feel this way or think this way. Um, I open myself up and kind of trust that I'm going to come up with something that it's uh, interesting to me. And I've seen throughout my career that often that means that it, it also conveys something to other people. And that's really satisfying when it speaks to other people. Um, in fact, I, if it just spoke to, to me, me, I don't think that would be that interesting. Maybe for me, but I, I want to I want to communicate. Uh, you know, I want to be I want to communicate something. And so when when people respond to my work, I feel oh good, it is communicating something, and it communicates different things to different people. I think. Um, and that's fine too. What a wonderful place to end our oh, conversation. <laughs>